welcome to AgriSummit 2021, the Canada-Africa Agriculture Summit focused on harnessing possibilities across the value chain. My name is Sherry Lee, Director of Partnerships and Public Affairs with the Economic Innovation Institute for Africa. The timing for crucial conversations on advancing Canada-Africa commercial relations, particularly in the agricultural sector, has never been more important. To make major advances, key players across the entire value chain must be at the table. I am pleased to introduce the moderator for this panel, Mr. Fergus McLaren, Director of International Relations and Knowledge Management with the Economic Innovation Institute for Africa. Fergus McLaren is a sustainable tourism and cultural heritage management professional with 25 years of experience in Canada, Asia, and Africa, with much of his current focus involving tourism to world heritage sites and the implementation of the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals. His background includes a broad range of tourism planning, destination, management, and community development expertise. His professional experience includes coordinating international meetings and input as the director of the UN-funded International Year of Eco to Ecotourism, teaching sustainable tourism at Canada's McGill University and lecturing on the subject at post-secondary institutions internationally. Fergus currently serves as the president of the International Council on Monuments and Sites International Cultural Tourism Committee and works in expert and professional capacities for the, for the Economic Innovation Institute for Africa, UNESCO, the UNWTO, the Organization of World Heritage Cities, the World Monuments Fund, and the Heritage and Cultural Society for Africa. Fergus, I will now hand the panel over to you, and I look forward to a very thought-provoking discussion. So just to give you a sense of what the session's about, gender equality remains a key priority in the Canada-Africa development assistance space. According to the World Bank, not only are women potential beneficiaries of efforts to achieve the SDGs, the 2030 goals cannot be realized without the participation of female entrepreneurs in sectors like agriculture. This session provides in-depth Canada-Africa perspective on progress towards ending hunger, achieving food security, sustainable agriculture, and providing nutrition interventions to those who need them most. We have as our speakers, Dr. Padu Tomi, Chief Executive Officer of Integrated Produce City in Lagos, Nigeria. Dr. Teddy Sami, Director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada and Dr. Mandana Arabi, Vice President, Global Technical Services and Chief Technical Advisor of Nutrition International in Ottawa, Canada. So to start off with uh, Dr. Otomi, I thought I'd give you a quick uh, background. He's, uh, he's a very accomplished individual. And I just, uh, as I was speaking with him before, it's hard to summarize it in such a sort of a, a short time frame, but I'll, I'll try to do so in advance of his presentation. Dr. Otomi is a noted political economist, professor of entrepreneurship, who has served as director of the Center for Applied Economics at the Lagos Business School, and is also a celebrated boardroom veteran. He serves on the board of the Africa practice of leading global professionals services firm Deloitte, as one of only two non-executives on the Africa board. He has been a top executive in manufacturing as chief operating officer for the Volkswagen of Nigeria, and in the social enterprise sector as founder of the Center for Values in leadership and chairman of the board's several highly regarded social enterprises, such as PIN, Women Arise, and Nutra, Nigerians United to Resist Anarchy. He has served in government at a presidential advisory position at age 27 and chairman of boards of parastatals, including the National Manpower Board. Dr. Utomi was voted by the Nigerian public in a Vanguard newspaper Silverbird television poll as one of Nigeria's top 10 living legends in 2009, and is considered one of Nigeria's top academics, a leading corporate executive and entrepreneur, civil society icon and politician. He was nominated twice as candidate for office of the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He is a fellow of several professional bodies, including the Institute of Management Consultants of Nigeria and the Nigerian Institute of Public Relations. And in closing of note, he has received over 1,500 awards and citations for his well-regarded work in academia, governance, entrepreneurship, 
politics, public life, journalism, faith, and service. Dr. Otomi was recently elected chairman of PathTrack, the Pan-African Sector Trade and Investment Committee, sponsored by the African Union and Afrexim Bank. So, uh, Pat, for you to begin, uh, you're welcome. And afterwards, you'll have to tell me the secret of how you get sleep, given all your various responsibilities that you have. I actually don't get any sleep. <laughs> no, but really, <laughs> I, I do sleep uh, as much as is necessary. But it's wonderful to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, I think that the subject um, matter is one that is of great interest uh, uh, to people of concern about the well-being of uh, Africans because we have a peculiar situation where African economies were first built on um, essentially uh, commodities exports and in many cases, this affected food security. Uh, but we have come to a point where, um, you know, the fortunes of commodities exports have been significantly challenged. And people have actually lost the capacity to produce for their own food security. Uh, when I was growing up in Nigeria, I lived in a part of Nigeria called uh, Northern Nigeria. I lived around Nigeria. My father was um manager for british petroleum and got transferred around uh, uh so i lived in a, almost every part of nigeria but in the northern part of nigeria we had these great groundnut pyramids that rose into the sky they were both tourist uh, uh, uh material on the one hand and uh, a source of revenue for the country because these peanuts were exported um, but today you won't see any of them of course oil and Dutch disease, and what I like to refer to as the uh, dangerous alchemy of soldiers and oil, because soldiers centralize authority, and oil takes away from, you know, they are requiring to raise taxes from the people. And so all of this led to um, the, the, the demise of, of agriculture. Now the future lies, in my view, in taking the factor endowments that exist for countries around Africa, around agriculture, deepening processing of the, the uh, produce in uh, Africa and trying to um, essentially be key players in global value chains of select agricultural produce. Now this whole general concept uh, I guess in structural economics today will be referred to as uh, playing uh, the latent comparative advantage uh, into global value chains. And I have been keenly interested. I, I, I did something terrible. That's why I lost all the sleep. When I was in grad school in the United States back in the late 70s, I said I was going to be critical of, of things that were not going right on my return. And, but I would never criticize something that I didn't do anything about. And that's how I got to overstretch. Because anytime I, I was publicly critical of anything, I try to find some solution. I'm practically, as an entrepreneur, try to do something in that territory. And this is um, uh, part of the burden of 40 years that I have, um, I have faced. But I am convinced that unless we can get policymakers to recognize that playing on the latent comparative advantage and taking all the critical stakeholders, women, who have a very important role uh, to play. I mean, they significantly dominate in terms of numbers, agriculture, believe it or not, in many African countries, yet they get so little from the process and they bear the brunt of the poverty of a continent. And so when the concept of uh, uh, doing uh, essentially what I like to call integrated agri-industrial towns uh, became part of my, my effort to intervene. We had to work things such that outgrower schemes that will work mainly on the more reliable farmers, by the way, the women, and then aggregating at these, these agri-industrial towns that we're trying to develop 
uh, we call the integrated produce city, and um, aggregating across borders because Africa needs to do that to to get the kind of volume that will make it a serious player on the international stage. And and so um, I got involved in discussing this at the level of the Africa Exim Bank, and then I was then named or elected chairman of PAFTRAC, the private uh, uh, sector trade and investment committee uh, of um, the African Union uh, to get policy uh, ideas from the private sector to influence uh, policymakers uh, uh, so that we can make these choices. And so hopefully we'll begin to, with the, uh, um, after the uh, African continental free trade area, we'll begin to uh, aggregate across borders in such uh, 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 clusters as the uh, integrated produce city, get more value added, create more employment, uh, 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 ensure food security, and enough for quality export, not those that get turned down when they get abroad. And to do this, we need partners. And I, I think the Canadians will be remarkable partners for African entrepreneurs who are willing to do the work, the drudgery of building uh, such um, uh, uh, initiatives and to compete globally. The competitiveness is key. And, and I think that the experience of many Canadian entrepreneurs uh, partnering with African ones will definitely make a huge difference in reshaping the landscape as, as we know it today. So I, I think that if I take that as my uh, remark of introduction, we can uh, take it from there. Uh, thanks, Pat. That was a really excellent, very thorough summary. In five minutes, you really incorporated a lot of information. And I know that we have a number of Canadian partners um, in various provinces and various sectors and levels of government uh, across the country who would be eager to participate in what you refer to as that drudgery of doing sort of the groundwork or the spade work that's necessary to build a strong foundation for women to participate in agriculture across Canada. So thank you for your points. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Teddy Sami, who's the director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University in Canada. Uh, Dr. Sami, his research interests intersect the broad areas of international and development economics, and his current research focuses on domestic resource mobilization, fragile states, foreign and income inequality, and foreign income inequality. His most recent books are Exiting the Fragility Trap, Rethinking Our Approach Within the World's Most Fragile States, published by Ohio University Press in 2019, co-authored with David Carmet and the African Economic Development by Rutledge in 2018, and co-authored with Arch Ritter and Stephen Langdon on that publication. His research has appeared in journals such as the Canadian Journal of Development Studies, Third World Quarterly, International Interactions, the Journal of Conflict Revolution, Resolution, Conflict Management and Peace Science, Foreign Policy Analysis, and Applied Economics. Professor Sami is a recipient of a Research Achievement Award in 2013-2014 and a Research Excellence Award 2008 from Carleton University. Interestingly, and you'll see why, he currently serves on the board of IMPACT, formerly known as Partnership Africa, where my wife worked 30 years ago. So that's an interesting connection. Uh, Professor Sami holds a doctorate in economics from the University of Ottawa, a master's in economics from the University of Toronto, and a bachelor's honors in economics and mathematics from York University. Dr. Sami, I welcome you to give your, give your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Fergus, and it's a pleasure to meet you and all the other panelists uh, for today's event. Um, let me start by saying that any issue that we try to examine with respect to Sub-Saharan Africa has inevitably to recognize the diversity of the African experience. I think this is worth repeating. So we have 48 countries that are part of a region, and these countries are very different when you look at the size in terms of geographic size, population, climate, resource endowments, the economic structure, their income patterns. So it's not a surprise that their experience with respect to the agricultural sector is also going to be quite different. 
Having said that, many sub-Saharan African countries have also been affected by common historical, contemporary, and even external factors more recently. Uh, but there are a few realities that our previous speaker has also highlighted that I want to, to mention. One is most people, and we're talking about more than 50% in the African context, are working in agriculture. And this proportion gets bigger as countries are poorer. Right? So if you look at some of the poorest countries in the world, that number is significantly over 50%. The other interesting phenomenon there is that uh, you also have a higher percentage of women that are working in agriculture than men. So the importance of the roles of women in the sector uh, could not be uh, emphasized enough. The other thing to keep in mind is that the agricultural sector by and large provides food subsistence to households who are involved in production uh, in countries where you have a large agricultural workforce. So even as small farms and large firms produced for the local and export markets, for the most part, that labor is used to provide food for the household. Sometimes you will have households who supplement uh, by marketing their output or engaging in off-farm off opportunities. But what subsistence does, it means that for many farmers, they tend to be risk averse. So when it comes to how they cultivate, because failure could have drastic consequences for them, they are not willing to take risks. The third thing that I want to talk about is the variation in environmental conditions, which also affect the sector's potential, right? So the FAO, for instance, identifies 16 different agroecological zones, looking at rainfall patterns, elevation, extent of forest cover. And what this means essentially is that with climate change, the pressures that result from climate change will impact these zones differently. And perhaps even more importantly, most of the impact is going to be negative. The fourth factor adding to climate change is population pressure, which has led to a decline in how much land per household uh, is available. That puts pressure on food crop production, and it also creates incentives to think about farming methods differently. And the final reality that I want to mention is that we have very different farming systems, and that is essentially the result of having different food crops in people's diets. So when we talk about improving productivity, which is a key issue in the African context, when it comes to agriculture, we need to think about these different systems, uh, these different agricultural systems. So what do these realities tell us? So we note that the sector continues to be characterized by household subsistence production mostly, Farmers tend to be risk averse. They don't use inputs enough. There is very limited irrigation in some cases. Productivity of agriculture has improved, so that's a good thing, but it still lags other developing regions such as Asia. And the extent to which productivity has improved varies across countries within the subregion, right? So there are African countries where we've seen more improvements than in others, right? So basically the gains in productivity have not been shared equally across the board. Interestingly, many small scale farmers have shown that they have a capacity to improve their systems. But as I've mentioned, there are risks, so climate change, disease. The other issue, of course, which this panel is, is uh, engaging with, and I think is, is important, is the fact that gender discrimination remains pervasive uh, across countries. Um, so these risks and constraints that I've talked about have to somehow be overcome. And there's a big debate in the literature about whether agriculture is the key uh, to successful poverty reduction in Africa. And I would argue that small scale, uh, smallholder agriculture can actually provide a dynamic contribution to reducing poverty in, uh, on, on the continent. And this is partly because improvements in that sector will affect incomes of many millions of poorer households directly and also because these gains could have indirect effects. So for example, when you source inputs locally in rural areas, or if you're increasing the supply of local food crops that will reduce food prices, these can have important impacts, positive impacts on consumers. Uh, I've talked a bit about gender inequalities. I think it's, it's worth remembering that these are ubiquitous in, in rural Africa and that they prevent women from receiving an equal share of poverty reduction gains. There are some interesting examples. So for instance, in Ethiopia, uh, uh, the rights of women to own land has been changed by policy. But I think the, the bigger challenge is how do, you how do you essentially change social attitudes and institutions, right? 
these are more difficult to accomplish and women have to be part of that process. So, so basically the focus on gender equality is important given the role that women play in the sector, but it's not an easy task, right? Finally, I'm not an expert on food insecurity or food security, but I have to note that it's been rising in recent years and, and we know what the drivers are. So conflict, climate change, population pressures, low food productivity as well. Uh, these are well known, but I will close by saying that they are likely to be exacerbated by the ongoing pandemic. So in short, there are numerous opportunities for the sector that I think need to be uh, examined more carefully, but there are also challenges ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. That's a very good uh, perspective and overview, particularly looking at it, framing it uh, or looking or framing it from an economic standpoint in terms of inputs and factors that are affecting the success in that field or this domain. So that was very well laid out. So thank you for presenting that information to us. Our third speaker is Dr. Mandara, Mandana Arabi, who is the Vice President of Global Technical Services and the Chief Technical Advisor for Nutritional for Nutrition International based in Ottawa, Canada. So um, Dr. Rabi is Vice President of Global Technical Services and Chief Technical Advisor of Nutrition International. She oversees the Technical Quality of Nutrition International's programs in 10 countries and leads a global team of experts tasked with addressing the most critical gaps. Difficult to fill in the evidence and practice to improve nutrition, especially for vulnerable populations, including adolescent girls, women, and young children. Dr. Rabi is a qualified medical practitioner with a doctorate in nutritional science from Cornell University. She has over 15 years of experience in public health, nutrition, designing, implementing, and evaluating nutrition interventions in countries with high burden of malnutrition. She was also a nutrition advisor for UNICEF, founding executive director of the New York Academy of Sciences Nutrition Institute and nutrition technical advisor to the Ministry of Health in Iran. As an expert in global health and nutrition, she has led several collaborative research projects, technical advisor groups, consultations and publication series involving the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and teams of university authors. She has co-authored various global guidance documents, including the UNICEF Nutrition Programming Guide, World Health Organization Indicators for Infant and child, Young Child Feeding. Dr. Rabi, I, you're welcome to give your presentation. Yes, thank you very much and thanks uh, to the organizers for um, inviting us and really focusing on this important topic today. And I actually feel that uh, my uh, remarks are uh, well suited to what the esteemed speakers so far covered. You know, we discussed the issues of uh, food security and the importance of the focus on uh, these issues in Africa and also investing in, in women's um, and, and women's a specific approach. What I want to do is to take the food security even one step farther and talk about nutrition security. From my background, you heard the word nutrition a lot, so you can imagine that I'm very passionate about this topic and I've focused my career in working on this. And the point is that when we are talking about hunger and we are talking about malnutrition, it's really not just about the amount of food and the availability of food, though those, of course, are very important. Another step is the quality of food, the nutrient content of those foods, and making sure that the food meets the needs of the special populations that have those high needs, such as women and young children. So talking about nutrition security is talking about really foods that have the quality that meets the needs of the populations. And some of these nutritional issues are definitely women's issues. You know, for example, iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia is a condition that's mostly seen in women. It's a feminist issue in a way. And in general, nutrition can lead to better productivity. You know, there is even evidence following up uh, populations of children who receive better nutrition. And you see later on as adults, they have higher incomes, higher ability to get better jobs, to have, um, you know, um, more um, kind of productivity um, to the society, as well as nutrition just being a right of a person and allowing us to be more resilient to diseases, again, in the context of the current global pandemic more than ever, we need to have the resilience and to build those, especially for the populations that have high vulnerability. And that's why um, the focus today is on one of the nutrition interventions that we feel is low cost and high impact, and that's called food fortification. It's also very much linked to agriculture because it's a way to add value to agricultural products and really make sure that the nutrient content is optimized 
for some of these key staples and agricultural products before they reach the consumers. So food fortification is basically adding some of these key nutrients to staples. For example, adding iron or folate to wheat flour or to rice flour. And that fortified rice or wheat would be of high nutrient quality and be able to um, help us fight things like iron deficiency anemia. There has been a lot of work and research and guidelines from the World Health Organization, Food and Agriculture Organization. We think that we have proven that this is low cost, high impact and has really good proven public health and economic outcomes. And it helps us also um, reach some of those, um, you know, hunger and malnutrition goals that are part of our global development um, outcomes for the uh, global community. Next, please. Um, also, um, our speaker um, before me, Dr. Sami, mentioned the diversity of experience in Africa, and I was just reflecting about this slide that I put here, and I think this also shows us that diversity, while at the same time it's talking about the extent of the same problem, which is the anemia, anemia prevalence. And a lot of anemia causes are related to nutrition deficiencies, not all of them, but if you address nutrition deficiencies, you really will be able to move the anemia um, targets towards a much better optimal situation. Uh, fortification standards, um, in, like when you look at across Africa, actually we have come a long way. 27 countries have mandatory legislations that um, makes them uh, to fortify at least one cereal grain or oil. So there is at least one product that in these countries, uh, technically according to legislation, needs to be fortified. And many of them also have reached the scales. More than 75% is actually fortified. Again, you know, I think this is an achievement that needs to be celebrated. But at the same time, we still have 10 countries that have less than 75% coverage. And um, at the same time, when you look at the picture of anemia, 53 countries in Africa have severe and moderate anemia. So I, it just, you know, I put this map here to say that, you know, it seems that the problem is still there. We have made progress. It's a feminist issue being an issue that's about targeting a problem that's seen more in women. And I think the progress tells us that, you know, things can be done, impact is possible. So we really need to make sure that we make the right investments to even take this farther than it is now right now. Next, please. Another map that I wanted to quickly show you is about another nutrient deficiency, which is iodine deficiency. And this is um, something that causes, you know, um, reduced um, uh, IQ points in children, um, goiter and, uh, you know, growth and metabolism um, issues in women and uh, basically a whole of population. Iodine deficiency used to be pandemic in a lot of countries. Again, as you see, 44 countries in Africa now have mandatory legislations for adding iodine to the salt and 29 have less than 90% coverage, which is a goal that we want to get. You know, you really have to have universal salt iodization to be successful in eliminating all the deficiency disorders. And we can still benefit from working in these countries to improve the situation. And then iodine intake has improved in many countries over Africa. It's one of the successes of the nutrition field actually, but it's still six or seven countries are there that really would benefit from uh, improving the intake and improving the iodine intake. Next, please. And finally, I just put this here because this is a guide for us when we want to go to countries and help the governments. You know, my organization, Nutrition International, we work as an allies and expert allies in technical fields to the governments, help them set up these public health programs. And we are supported by the generous support of the government of Canada, but also other donors that have allowed us to continue this work. And we have a process for engaging at the country level. We first, you know, work with the government to justify why we need fortification, which nutrients for which vehicles and which staple foods. So there's a lot of analysis and technical work that goes into that. And my team usually is heavily involved in the, doing those assessments and helping the governments make the best decisions about which mix of interventions would work in that setting, in that specific context um, that we discussed earlier. And then we help advocate and engage. We need to really bring different sectors together, agriculture, private sector that's involved in developing kind of milling industry, for example, for wheat flour, salt industry for salt. And then we have to develop the guiding structures for how you set up these standards for doing the fortification at the right level in a safe way to keep monitoring and operationalizing. And what I wanted to show is that through all, all of this process, you also can apply a gender lens to the whole fortification blueprint. 
the you know while fortification is fortifying the staple food for all of the population it addresses a problem that is a women's problem in a, in a major way so that's in itself a kind of gender based approach but also we can have the analysis in a way that you know we make sure we look at how, what the situation of women is the type of interventions that would work well for them and for the problems and deficiencies that they face uh, we want we will advocate for gender specific plans and programs and target women's groups when we can identify fortification champions um, uh, within the industry we include women specific considerations in drafting the documents and guidelines, uh, putting some monitoring outcomes that would look at the situation of the women and improvements in their situations and report those, so make sure that those are visible. And also as an industry, it can also provide economic opportunities for women. And I think that's something that I think we can do a better job of making sure that within this whole industry for fortifying food, women are more engaged and uh, this is also a way for providing economic opportunities to them. So all in all, just wanted to bring this as a way to link food and nutrition security together in, a, in an approach to improving the situation of women and vulnerable populations. And happy to address questions later in this panel. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Mandana. That was a very well sort of illustrated approach in terms of the high level nutritional issues that are there and more specifically how they can be focused on some of the gender issues or the disparities that are occurring in different parts of Africa that are caused by food security, food availability, or in this case, many different sorts of nutrients that can help maintain the health and well-being of women and girls. So thank you very much for using that and introducing that uh, framework to us for this panel. So as uh, from the beginning, as mentioned before, the, the panel's title is Nutrition Security, Gender Equality, and Sustainable Development. So Given uh, the the past three presentations that we've had from our panelists, uh, we thought we'd you know dig down a little deeper, get more insight and more perspective. And uh, if you'll permit me, I'll I have three questions for each of you. But what I will do is that I will I will give a different order of those questions so that uh, we'll have a chance to respond in terms of the specific question that's being posed to you, and uh, just you know give you thoughts and um, perspectives that you'll have on the question that's being asked. So uh, Pat, I'll start with you if you don't mind. And uh, the question that I have for you, first one is how is Canada's, sorry, what has been the greatest challenge faced by your company, Integrated Produce City? Well, uh, the first uh, challenge that understand something that is, well, let's say new in, in the sense of how we approach uh, a solution to problem. Uh, new in the sense that, i give you a, a, an example. Uh, um, there is a very uh, uh, um, sophisticated investor, let's call him that, who made a lot of money from oil. And um, I went to him to take an equity position in the venture, made a presentation to his, um, that people, just want to continue to extract rent and not to do the things that will involve a lot of work and ultimately make the kind of impact that's required to change things. So we had investment challenges to get in resources. We, we have a huge expanse of land that we're working out of. Now, the way bankers see land you know the, the, there is a um, uh, um an economist um, called hernando de soto who's written this book about the mystery of capital and which he makes the point that you know the poor um have a lot of assets but their assets don't become capital because of the absence of representational systems in, in the united states in canada in europe every parcel of land has value. It is caught in a representational system, a land registry, and because of that value, it becomes fungible and can translate into capital. In Africa, unless the land is in prime location in the capital city, it literally has no value at all because it cannot be converted to capital. 
So we have this land, which in the study that KPMG did for us is worth $12.5 million. But it doesn't mean anything to a bank. You, they can't lend you money against such a holding. So there's a huge problem with financing an initiative of that nature. Uh, of course, African banks usually say, ah, agriculture is too risky. Oh, we need this to de-risk agriculture. So we have the burden of finance. Um, we want to introduce technology, bringing young people to act as extension agents, using technology, reach these women, and all of those. And this is a challenge, of course. We have to educate a lot of people. So that kind of challenge you have to deal with. Uh, but you also have to deal with the fact that government officials are usually not as helpful as they could be. <laughs> Many years ago, I wrote a book titled Managing Uncertainty, uh, Competition and Strategy in Emerging Economies. And, and, and part of the argument of that book is that you can't take, say, a model of competitive strategy uh, from structural economics, the so-called structure, conduct, performance paradigm. Uh, Michael Porter at Harvard is particularly famous for that his own model uh, in that paradigm. You can apply it to African countries and get really the same outcome because there's a huge unknown. And I call this the predatory effects of government action and public officials. Something that makes sense ordinarily, uh, uh, you will be surprised how regulatory risk can be the biggest risk in doing business in, in Africa regulators, you know, a concept of power that they have in supervising these little boys as they see everybody who is not in public authority, uh, usually leads to decisions that are made that can bring a lot of uncertainty into a process. So uh, it's a huge challenge, but I believe that entrepreneurship is really about dealing with those kinds of things and ultimately reducing uncertainty to a measurable risk. And that's what we've been working at these last couple of years with this project. Uh, but it has meant investing everything that we can manage into it. Okay, that, that, that's a very good response. And I, I can see where the risks are those that are internal within the country and those that are expressed externally as well. When you think of the uh, the tariffs, when you think of the the agricultural controls and the other measures that are there, and certainly um, I can see that being a big issue. And and as you mentioned, uh, same as in Canada, same as in the United States, other parts of the world, uh, younger people are leaving the agricultural sector. That's also uh, getting agricultural workers who are skilled in that area is another challenge, particularly. And this may be an opportunity for uh, young women and girls to participate if they have that knowledge and skill to benefit in another way from the agricultural sector. So that's something to consider. So thank you. Uh, Teddy, I have a first question for you. And that is that, uh, how is Canada's Feminist International Assistance Policy helping to address some of the challenges that you have mentioned in your opening statement? So again, you know, official government policy regarding our development assistance overseas. Yes, uh, thank you, Fergus, for, for the question. Um, so for, for those of you who remember a little bit about six years ago, so it was so since we are in uh, uh, we are having another election in Canada, it, it's in, it's interesting that you know people will remember that in 2015 uh, when the liberals were campaigning, uh, one of the key elements of the platform was feminism, and a couple of years later after they form the government, uh, Canada's Feminist International Assistance Policy, or FIAP, was announced in 2017. And the FIAP supports gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. In theory, uh, and I'll come back to this later on uh, in terms of, you know, what, what some of the challenges are in, um, in theory, as I said, you know, the different action areas that form part of a FIAP, I would argue that tick the right boxes insofar as the nature of gender inequalities and agriculture in general as a sector uh, are related, right? So in, in 
my opening remarks and I think other speakers have made the point that, you know, there's, you know, everybody knows that there's significant gender inequalities in the agricultural sector. Uh, so in, in theory, the FIAP and its different action areas, they tick the right boxes. I mean, so for example, in the FIAP, you have those six action areas, the core one being gender equality and women empowerment, women and girls empowerment. And then you have other action areas that include human dignity. And under human dignity, you have health and nutrition, education, humanitarian action. So nutrition is there. And then you have growth that works for everyone. You have environment and climate action. You have inclusive governance. And then you have peace and security. And Canada made a commitment to target a certain proportion of its aid uh, towards uh, specific objectives um, and including towards Africa, right? Um, and so when you look at agriculture, um, unfortunately, the numbers are not that great. So while you know the policy itself uh, ticks the right boxes, uh, I think the latest number that I saw, I think it was from 2019, and I doubt that the number would have changed significantly since. I think Canada allocated about 5% of its total ODA, so 5% of its total official development assistance on agriculture and rural development. That number actually has not changed that much in the last few years. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the, the fluctuations have been quite small and they've been declining since 2009. You, those who remember 2009 will recall that there was a global food crisis and you know there was a significant increase in in aid towards agriculture at that point but since then canada's aid to agriculture has actually fallen uh to pre-2008 levels so it went up and then has been on a, a slow but continuous decline since then uh, i should note also that agriculture uh under the fiat falls mainly under the action area of growth that works for everyone and so the policy itself uh, looks at food security and agriculture as part of a broader lens of women empowerment and, and gender. So uh, gender inclusive uh, uh, climate change mitigation, sorry. So, you know, it, it's interesting that, that we have this policy, which is, I think, on paper, uh, where the target should be in terms of targeting women who are a big part of the agricultural sector. Uh, and but in practice, I think, and I'll come back to this later on, perhaps is uh, talk a bit about the gaps in, in terms of what Canada is facing, I think has a lot to do with the resources and our commitments right, towards the sector. The final thing I would say is that, you know, given the impact that the pandemic ha is having on agricultural systems and food security, uh, the Canadian government has also, in fairness to, to them, made commitments uh, to agriculture as part of its response. Um, so, you know, I, so to come back to, to the nature of the question itself in terms of how this policy is addressing some of the challenges, I think concretely, much of the investments that we've made have been in agri-food systems and they are having impact in, in some cases. There's interesting projects taking place in, in different countries, but I think the scale of a problem compared to the scale of what is being invested is something that we need to take a closer look at. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. That's a very good overview. And as, as you mentioned, that's been uh, the cornerstone of foreign, Canada's foreign policy uh, aid assistance, of uh, aid assistance, uh, um, working with uh, women and young girls to improve their livelihoods and well-being. And certainly there's a, there could be a gap sometimes between commitments and actual results at the same time. And particularly in the agricultural sector, and particularly in poor countries that, uh, or poorer countries that depend on agriculture as a key driver of economic development and supporting communities and families at the same time. So, Mandana, my uh, third question, uh, my third uh, speaker, first question for you is that uh, you've talked about assessing the feasibility of fortification in an optimal mix of interventions with regard to nutrition. Can you expand on this a bit more for the audience, please? 
Sure, thank you very much. Um, the way we approach nutrition is, you know, we don't have a single nutrition system, the way that you have a system for delivering health, for example. You know, you have a health system, you have a mechanism for implementing and the very kind of delivering very specific interventions. Nutrition by its nature is quite multi-sectoral and multifaceted. And because of that, we have come up with the approaches for assessing what are the needs of populations and then identifying a mix of the right types of interventions. Some of them go through the health system, for example, pregnant women, because of their high needs for iron, they need iron and folate supplements. You know, in more developed countries, those are even things that are over the counter and pregnant women could just buy it from, you know, pharmacies that easily, but in places where we work, the access and availability is quite low. So those are interventions that we actually have to design, work on the supply, work with the government to be able to get those to the health centers. And through the health system, we get those interventions to the pregnant women and to the women who need those in, in high need type uh, kind of parts of their life cycle. Similarly for young children, you know, we work on uh, supporting breastfeeding mothers, helping them with uh, you know, solving problems, nutritional issues during their, those very uh, important early years. So these are some interventions, for example, that we have historically implemented through the health system. Um, fortification is an intervention that's actually not necessarily done through the health system. That's why I chose it as a topic for today's panel, because it's linked actually more closely to the food system. And the agriculture and it's something that's uh, kind of added value to agricultural products you know it could be during the processing during the milling or you know for for example recently we have gotten into fortification of lentils for example that's another novel area especially if with Canada being a large scale lentil producer and exporter, you know, can you actually do fort fortify the lentils as they are being packaged and ready to be sent all throughout the world and improve the nutrition of the populations that receive them to the much sheer, you know, larger scale than you know, the unfortified lentils potentially could do. So these are some ways for us to really look at what nutrition can be, like what type of nutritional interventions can be embedded across different systems. And fortification being one of them that can be done through food system and linked to agriculture, as well as, you know, health system interventions. In education, we can work on improving nutrition for nutrition education. And all of these have to come together so that you have a good baseline of good nutrition for all of the population and then some a specific targeted additional interventions to those groups that have higher needs, such as pregnant and lactating women and young children. And that's what we call the optimal mix. And that's the challenge because in a lot of countries, when you have one intervention going to scale, then the governments don't have a lot of interest in, again, kind of saying, okay, well, you know, you're fortifying you know, our wheat with um, uh, iodine, uh, with iron, why do we need also to do iron folate supplementation in the health system? But the point is that you need to have an overlap of these different interventions that target different age groups, as well as a good baseline of nutrition for the whole population to get the, the optimal results. So that's why we also need to show up in this kind of cross-sectoral and uh, cross-disciplinary panels to make sure that nutrition is part of these conversations when bigger decisions and bigger interventions are being designed and even foreign assistance approaches, economic approaches are being designed, nutrition being one of the targets that hopefully we'll be able to achieve through, the, to achieve through these more macro level interventions. Thank you. Thank you, Mandata. You raised some very good points, particularly the fact that, uh, as with uh, Pat's integrated food city, there is also a need to integrate nutrition into the process as well. It's uh, it's it's, it's multivaried, multifaceted, and uh, certainly from the supply chain and the value chain that comes from it as well, in terms of what you're creating, but you know more importantly how it's distributed, the access to it, and the nutritional value that comes from it. It's it's something that really, as you said, needs a real cross-sectoral approach. So this is certainly something, Pat, to consider for what you're doing with your great operation in Nigeria. Um, I had my second question for you, Pat, and that is uh, looking at Canada's vast potential in terms of agricultural research, innovation, and technology, what specific beneficial partnerships do you think a country like Nigeria should pursue? Farming. One of the things that's happened, oh, uh, part of the point that has been made, uh, I think Teddy made a point about um, um, the low productivity in African agriculture. Um, of course, part of it is a function of know-how and know-why. Um, 
second part of it is a function of tradition and investment. But when, especially when small to medium scale people who typically do not go international as business people can be brought together with medium sized players in countries that could profit from their knowledge and their market access, uh, a lot can happen that is mutually beneficial, actually. And I, I, I look at the work we're trying to do organizing smallholder farmers. Um, and if we had partners who are farmers, say in Canada, working with us, investing in some of those um, outgrower schemes with local farmers, increasing their yield, the output, and, and all of that. Uh, uh, besides the financial profit on both sides, uh, it will do a lot for the quality of life of people who are involved in this, including the women that we've talked about, and literally change uh, um, many of the problems that we we have. I mean, we, there's so much talk about instability, uh, you know, uh, uh, insurgencies around the place. Most of those are problems of poverty uh, because people who are poor, who are vulnerable, are easy to recruit into all kinds of crazy movement that are violent and and disrupt the lives of people. Uh, so, twinning of farmers, um, you know, export. You know, Canadian farmers can produce certain things that are better to, or easier to produce in Africa and export them to other parts of the world. Um, I mean, if you take a small example, Vietnam, just Vietnam has come out of this war comes into some African countries, purchases cashew nuts, raw cashew nuts, no value added, ships them all the way across the world to Vietnam, processes them, and then sells them to all the major global airlines and department stores in Europe. And, and so much more could be done if you added value to cashew nuts in Africa. And Africa is much closer to those markets than far out Vietnam uh, and other parts of Asia. And, and the same people who are you know, living in Vietnam can do that just like in this case from, in, from Canada. So considering those kinds of partnership, I think will make a huge difference. Thank you, Pat. That's a really good outline. And uh, I, I've actually worked in Vietnam a fair bit. I didn't realize they were doing this cross international trade in cashew nuts. I might invest in it, so we'll have to see. But uh, I think, you know, one of the things is that it's, it's a really good example to show that it's not just uh, the agricultural knowledge and the different hybrids that are there, but also the value add, the marketing, the different sort of elements that are, uh, you know, sort of keystone is working the land or working with. Uh, uh, biodiversity, working with uh, f with uh, the animals, uh, the farm animals, etc. But at the same time, what is the value add, and especially in this context, you know, with the women and girls involvement, and on top of that, the African markets. Uh, it's okay to look internationally, but from a sustainability perspective, how do you inculcate these initiatives and activities within the continent itself? Because that has emissions impacts, that has sustainability impacts, and various other things to consider. So. Um, I think that's you raised a number of good points in terms of how we can share our experiences between Canadian and African and or Nigerian farmers. So Teddy, I have my second question for you, and that is uh, building on the first question, namely what Canada's footprint is currently in Africa when it comes to agriculture, food security and gender equality. What are the gaps that you see in Canada's approach and what else can Canada do? Thank you once again. Um, I've given what I've said. I think I'm going to go a little bit broader in in the sense of uh, looking at 
how we spend and how much we spend in terms of foreign aid. Um, you know, it's 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 been known for a long time that Canada's aid commitments have fallen way below uh, the famous 0.7% target. And while I'm not myself a big fan of being fixated on actual numbers, it, it still remains the fact that the number is actually quite low as a percentage of Canada's gross national income. And I think in the last year, we've also seen that when there's a commitment to spend money, uh, governments will find the, the means to do that, at least domestically. So my concern when I look at agriculture specifically and how much Canada allocates to that sector uh, in developing countries, uh, given that it's fairly low, as I've mentioned before, and the fact that the Canadian aid dollars are also quite low overall as a percentage of income, I think the one issue is resources, right? So how do we ensure that the Canadian government can commit more resources overall to foreign aid, but also to a sector such as agriculture, which has wide ranging implications for the sub-Saharan African region for gender uh, equality and so on. So I think resources certainly need to be considered. And I would add to this that they also need to be better targeted. I think one of the reasons why I started my opening remarks with the diversity of the African experience is because I think we need to take a closer look at specific countries and their unique characteristics and constraints as opposed to applying a one-size-fits-all approach. And there are places where I think the agricultural sector has been relatively more successful and we can certainly learn from those. But there are also other places where agriculture uh, is in you know, more precarious uh, position, if you will. So I think having a differentiated approach that takes into account the country specific constraints uh, would make sense. And I think this speaks to a larger issue about Canada-Africa relations as well. I think Canada needs to have a broader understanding of what it wants to do on the continent. I, it's, you know, it's an issue that we certainly as at the research level have grappled with, or at least research and policy have grappled with for a long time, which is what is Canada's strategy towards Africa, right? And so we, we don't have a clear sense in my view about how we want to engage with the continent and, and with a sub-Saharan African region. And I think it's, it's an issue that that this country you know, needs needs to figure out. Um, and the final point I would make about, you know, what we are currently doing, I think we also need to think a little bit more broadly. I think there are other target areas that should be focused on and not just agriculture because they have implications for agricultural markets. So if you think about uh, the recently launched African Continental Free Trade Agreement, the single market has a huge potential to boost uh, intra-African trade. It could create a more competitive business environment. It could lead to the development of regional value chains. It could also strengthen national food production systems and make better links to regional markets, and the list goes on. And so certainly Canada can play a role in this, having helped negotiate the free trade agreement and supporting it in terms of resources. I think the next step would be also to support African countries implement the agreement, which has always been a key factor in previous regional uh, attempts to, to consolidate existing agreements. So I would say uh, in closing that we should not just look at agriculture specifically, we also need to think about the broader environment in which agricultural systems are operating and how we can assist countries. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy. You present a number of interesting perspectives, particularly uh, having worked with CETA many, many years ago. Uh, I saw that 0.7% uh, uh, development number, and it's it's been a struggle, and honestly, to to get there to that point, to try and maintain a high level of and um, quality, of course, of development assistance. The challenge, of course, is specifically in uh, Africa. You know, there are issues in terms of the fact that with uh, the 48 sub-Saharan African countries that you mentioned, Canada has different relations with all of them. They have different development priorities within the national development strategies for individual countries. And again, with such a, a wide range of economies, uh, the levels of development and perspective, and uh, particularly in the agricultural sector, uh, there are certainly issues that are there in trying to 
focus and best address uh, what the, the key or lead issues are. And, you know, the other thing is perhaps there needs to be a perspective in terms of, as we were talking before with Mandana about integration, you know, how you can focus on things like climate change. What does agriculture's role play in that? What sort of role does agriculture play in the SDGs? So, again, there's, you know, fulminating and, gen and new sorts of opportunities for agriculture to support and participate. And equally, at the same time, Canada's role within that. So thank you for your perspective. So last question for Pat. Um, in the context of the Africa African continental free trade area, how important is agriculture for job creation, regional integration, and poverty reduction on the continent? Uh, very important. Um, if you look at the ascendancy of some of the uh, economies of uh, Southeast Asia, and even Japan, you will see that a very important role uh, was played by the trading companies, the Marubenis of this world. And um, what they essentially do, which is uh, significantly affected uh, their play in world trade, where Africa is literally non-existent, uh, is that they have enabled huge aggregations so that there is a significant enough uh, volume to export and therefore to deal with the major distributors. Um, if uh, a major Canadian firm wanted 1 million pieces of something every Monday at 2 p.m., it would be impossible to trade with Africa or with African countries, but with after and the possibilities you could create companies like Marubeni that would literally aggregate produce from African farmers, you could then add significant value for export. Let's take cocoa. I mean, <laughs> cocoa uh, 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 leaves West Africa, mainly Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana these days used to be significantly Nigeria. And they head to Switzerland. And um, then chocolates get sold to Africans. Um, and even comes back actually through Egypt mainly and South Africa. Uh, um, and then redistributed uh, uh, across Africa. But if we had um, trading companies that could pull together the cocoa from uh, um, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, and then bargain with the major producers for a production facility to add value on the continent and export the value that is added, uh, Africa would get a lot more out of the fact that it produces so much cocoa. Um, and, and so this is a, a unique opportunity for collaboration because these trading companies don't have to be necessarily African regional. You could get major Canadian trading companies uh, in playing in the agriculture value chain to be part of a major trading company that has investors and stake from African countries that essentially help this cross-border aggregation uh, uh, across the continent in, on, on many value chains of, of produce and that would literally transform uh, um, incomes on the continent and facilitate African participation in, in international trade. Uh, because as I said, the numbers are fairly unsatisfactory. Uh, part of the hope is that with an African at WTO as a director general at this point, uh, perhaps her work can help facilitate this kind of engagement. But certainly, um, this is needed, sorely needed, if we're going to get 
uh, better participation for Africa. And as we know, trade and growth and quality of life can be easily linked together. And we uh, uh, look forward to uh, possibilities of that happening. And, and Canada playing a very important role uh, for mutual benefit purposes, really, uh, to facilitate this uh, aggregation possibility. I, I, I agree, and uh, you know, thank you for your point. And it's uh, there's Pat. There's a number of high level issues, like you said, you know, with the WTO, with tariffs, with controls and regulations, and of course, that eventually trickles down to the impact of women and girls in communities in terms of their opportunities to receive economic benefit, the opportunities to support their families, the opportunity to support their health and gain education. So again, there is that trickle down effect that comes from the policies that are in place that are uh, that were previously restricting uh, controls on you know agricultural activity between countries and in different commodities. And this is hopefully one of the benefits of the AFCATA is to lift those and to have more ease of uh, trade and uh, shipment of agricultural products between countries to rise that level of development. So thank you for your points. Mandana, I have uh, your second question next, and that is, how do you ensure that fortification programs are based on evidence? And what do you see as a role of an academic partner? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate this question, again, partly because I think it's uh, bringing me to an important aspect I wanted to highlight on, on this panel. And that is, you know, as we are talking about action on improving the situation at the population level, engaging the governments, changing policy, and those are all very important. I personally come from the thinking that, you know, you still need to have the technical expertise and kind of the evidence-based decision-making as a key element of these. And at least in my experience and in my field, sometimes, um, you know, it's not, it's not that easy because, you know, especially as academics, I also was trained as an academic. You're just not trained to be part of those conversations. Maybe the level of comfort and, you know, in engaging in those policy conversations is not there in academia. And at the same time, the opportunities don't come up, you know, where you usually talk to peers who understand you rather than try to kind of go into environments where necessarily you don't speak the same language and some kind of, you know, arrangements and change in paradigm needs to happen for those conversations to be productive. That said, again, especially in improving malnutrition, in addressing hunger and food security and nutrition security issues, I think that definitely this connection between technical work, academic Kind of expertise and the know-how and the problem-solving um, innovation uh, aspect as well as decision-making and policy really needs to happen and needs to be strengthened. We just can't afford to work in silos. Um, so again, as an example, I think my organization is a nonprofit organization which you know uniquely has a strong technical team within its staff and the way we support the government is not just going in and you know saying this is what needs to be done or being very um, prescriptive. We actually work with the government to assess the situation, to look at the epidemiology, the needs, the populations, the inequalities, and have a really kind of intricate way of helping them design the right kinds of interventions. Similarly, I think policy can be made in a way that it's based on what has worked and what is going to give us the biggest impact with the resources that we have and the constraints that are increasingly getting even more. Um, you know, data for decision making, doing analyses and base, basing our decisions on what has worked in other places in the world. I think these are things that the technical field can bring to the policy and uh, population level decision making. Um, one example, for example, that now we are excited about is we have a partnership as a nonprofit organization with the Saskatchewan Uni University of Saskatchewan in looking at fortifying lentils. And, um, you know, this is something that needs to have the lentils, pro, you know, agricultural kind of aspect of it, the production and the producers in Canada to be involved. But also it might actually have a really good business case. Um, you know, it might make uh, Canada more competitive, you know, in terms of exporting fortified lentils and finding a better market in places like Africa where the needs for those fortificants is also high. And um, you can solve a public health problem by getting more iron to those particular 
participants and you can also solve an economic or maybe bring additional economic benefits. So these are some of those win-win situations where working together across sectors would bring us to solutions that have different justifications, both from the public health as well as the economic and the development aspect. Thank you, Mandana. It's very well illustrated in terms of the, the interdisciplinarity that it can occur across different fields and the benefits that can come from that. And not, not only that, but also by working interdisciplinarily with different partners, different organizations, different sections of society, whether it's government, communities, academia, or others, you can have a multiplicity of benefits beyond the original intention that uh, it's not just about growing products, and it's not just about growing uh, agricultural goods. It's about the services that emanate from that, the health benefits, the economic benefits, the social benefits. All those elements that come up is managing, having and managing good agricultural policy and development. So thank you for your points. Uh, Teddy, I have your last question for you. And do you have any final thoughts to share given what has been discussed so far in uh, when you're talking about Canada's feminist, well, talking about agri Canada's development policy? Um, I don't have much to add other than to emphasize that I, I, you know, looking at the numbers and Canada's footprint, we obviously are constrained in terms of the resources that we have. And so until we are able to kind of jump over that hurdle, we just need to do what we're doing uh, more efficiently. So I, I have concerns when I look at how much is being spent and the magnitude or the scale of a problem, if you will, uh, when it comes to agriculture across Sub-Saharan Africa and how much of an impact can we have realistically, right? So I, I can't emphasize enough that, you know, as much as we, we don't need to get fixated on numbers, resources matter, right? How much you put into something does matter and, and how long you're able to sustain that effort also matters, right? I mean, development, takes time, uh, change yeah. takes time. And when you look at something like gender inequality, I've talked about the social, cultural, institutional constraints before. In many contexts, these things are difficult to change, right? So you need to find champions, you need to figure out what works, what doesn't, uh, there's resistance to change. And so these are not things that you can change overnight, right? And, and as we know in Canada, we often have a tendency to change everything when governments change. So who knows what will happen next week when we have a new government or maybe we'll have the same government, right? But I, 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 I have concerns about, you know, the effort and, and the sustainability of the effort and, and I guess how committed we are towards Africa as a region. I have yet to be convinced that the Canadian government sees Africa as a region of importance, right? Uh, I could be wrong and I'll be happy if, if I'm wrong on this, but my experience has been that we don't pay enough attention uh, to Africa as a region. We don't pay enough attention to Sub-Saharan Africa as a region. And I think we could do a lot better uh, with more resources, but also with a better strategy and a long-term strategy of how we engage uh, these very different countries, right? So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Teddy. It's you know, some very good points. And I think that, you know, particularly in terms of long-term sustainability, the reality is, is that there are a number of factors that uh, are uh, envisionable and some less so. I mean, who knew in February 2020 that we'd be 18 months into a uh, pandemic right now and the global effects of that pandemic? There are also the impacts of conflicts, uh, uh, natural disasters, uh, and climate change, of course, being a huge one, especially in the agricultural sector and the long-term, you know, what we're experiencing right now, the long-term effects. So there are a bunch of factors. There is policy and there is commitments, but there's also the reality of what's happening on the ground and the ability to initiate and sustain that at the same time, uh, whether from a Canadian development standpoint or some other perspective. So. Mandana, you have the honor of the last question, and I will provide that to you. Um, and that is, how does Nutrition International ensure gender equity and gender responsiveness in your programs? Which is a good way to end off our question sec section. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks for the honor. It's a responsibility to give it justice. Um, I can just give examples because we are all in, you know, in evolution. I don't think we are there yet. 
Um, one of the colleagues mentioned uh, Canada's feminist international assistance policy. I think that this is a great achievement, something to be proud of, and it's important to see um, that the government of Canada is serious about this. So similarly, we have taken it seriously, and we have actually, we look at across all of our programs, we have embedded indicators for um, different levels of gender responsiveness, and we really are achieving to get to the best and highest level. Um, another thing that's, you know, from the practical, pragmatic aspect of it, I think having gender expertise uh, within organizations such as mine and really making sure that the design of our interventions is really going to be done in consultation with that expertise is important. It has been a learning even for myself. It, uh, you know, if you are a woman or you've worked in development or you care about women's issues, which is, you know, what has been for me the case, doesn't mean that necessarily you are fully aware of what needs to be done to be gender sensitive and, and um, gender responsive. And I think having that expertise and bringing those learnings into our more kind of conventional ways of working in development is important. And it has made a difference in how we see these issues and how we make investments. And then eventually, um, the way Nutrition International works, our interventions are based about on needs and vulnerabilities. And I think women, definitely because of the life stages that they are in, because of the vulnerabilities that they have um, are more affected potentially by these vulnerabilities, especially in nutrition, by nutrition deficiencies, and they have higher needs. So they are one of our key target populations. We make investments in bringing specific nutrition interventions to them, uh, you know, iron and folate supplementation, making sure fortification is gender sensitive, and again, making sure that women's issues stay um, among the key topics in the international development where, you know, I work and we are looking forward to collaborating and also innovating more um, across the board. I mentioned the lentils for, for fortification as being one of the innovations. And I think that's a good, a good example for me to bring up in a panel like this, just to see the openness that, you know, as an international NGO, we have to working with other colleagues in other areas where they feel they want to bring this innovation and additional dimensions to the work that they are doing. So I'm hoping that from this panel and the similar ones, we will also find areas for those collaborations and follow-ups. Thank you. Thank you, Mandana. That's some very good points. I, I remember when 2016 was the International Year of Pulses, and certainly there was a focus on lentils and other legumes at that time as potential sources of nutrition. And the fact that you're enhancing that important crop and you know the the, the value that it brings to cultivation and to the health and nutrition of the communities that are involved, again uh, across the broad swath of activities that Nutrition International undertakes. Well done in terms of uh, supporting the agricultural sector, particularly the uh, women and girls participation in it. So thank you for uh, all of your uh, your responses. And uh, we're entering the the last uh, part of the of the event of the session. And uh, just to give you all uh, three minutes, uh, just to give a, a final sort of summary of points that you know anything that you'd like to add, anything that you've heard that really you'd like to elaborate on, or any sorts of uh, recommendations you'd like to make in this specific field that we're talking about. Um, sustainability, um, also, sorry, be the proper title, nutrition security, gender equality, and sustainable development. Uh, you know, you have three minutes and please feel free to elaborate as you see fit. Uh, Pat, you're welcome to start first. I think you muted, Pat. I'm sorry, yeah. That's okay. okay. All right. Um, let me say that I, I, I really feel uh, very Privilege, very fortunate to be part of this panel and to appreciate the um, organizers, and not only for putting this together, but for uh, inviting me to be part of it. Uh, I have learned quite a bit from this uh, panel, and would like to suggest maybe a thing or two that can flow from the learnings that I take away from this. Uh, the bit about fortification, nutrition fortification was so, so striking for me. And I think that this is something that we need to uh, uh, think about in the work that we do in the agri value chain in, in countries like in Africa. Uh, the incidence of disease uh, is such that uh, how well we fortify uh, what is available to especially the, the, the uh, lower income people, uh, I find very useful and how we can integrate 
work done in academia in Canada with the kind of work and advocacy uh, that you know has been talked about uh, here around uh, nutrition uh, fortification, I think is important. And then the the point that um, Teddy has repeated, uh, I think that it, about Canada's strategy in Africa. I think that it is not difficult to see that uh, Canada has not focused enough on the benefits of a relationship with Africa. Uh, for a long time, and I, it comes from the colonial tradition, I think, um, Africa was Britain's territory, France's territory. And, you know, if you want to deal with Africa, kind of what are they doing in Europe and how are they? Um, I think we, we live in a, in a world that should be changing. I think that there should um, be a strategy that is beyond just general, uh, you know, human solidarity, uh, things that's good to do just to feel good about your humanity, uh, to look at Africa as a major partner, trading partner that can lead to mutually beneficial uh, um, you know, uh, outcomes. And, and that Canada has a, a place as a leader on, on the planet to um, change its approach to how it engages the continent of Africa. I think that these are important learnings. As we try to get Africa to rethink how it approaches economic development that is sustainable, uh, it will be enormously valuable to have a partnership with Canada that has true impact. And I look forward to this. Many thanks, Pat. And we, we look forward to partnering with you as well. It's especially all the good work that you're doing. So thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Teddy, uh, thank Teddy. You have a, do you have any last final words you'd like to add or contribute? No, I want to thank Pat for saying what I wanted to say. I, I think he <laughs> he got it exactly right in terms of where I was going with this. So I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I think you know we all we we agree that this is this is really important. And so hopefully uh, uh, others will be listening and and paying attention. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy, very much. Madonna, again, you have the, the, the final opportunity here to give you three minutes or your response. I actually had one slide. I don't know if this is possible to show that. Uh, you can try. See if you can share that maybe on the bottom there. Technical and program gaps. And the reason I wanted to show this was in a way for me to close with acknowledging the investments that Canada is already doing in international development, at least and you know, especially through my organization, Nutrition International. And they have been a great supporter of NI, and um, this has been, I think, one of their major investments in international nutrition. And as you see, in Africa, we have a presence in a few countries. In Senegal, we are supporting feasibility, supply chain assessment, looking at rice fortification as a potentially new vehicle for getting nutrients to the population as rice consumption is increasing and also helping them build fortification monitoring systems, ensuring quality and uh, really making sure that the right amounts and right levels are going to be delivered to the population. Similarly, in Cote d'Ivoire um, and Ethiopia and Kenya. And I think there is, again, the opportunity to do more. I really was uh, pleased to hear Dr. Utomi mentioning also the fact that this could be linked linked to a specific social protection programs that are increasingly in the post-COVID context, I think are needed to target populations that are having additional vulnerabilities because of COVID and you know, because of job losses, lack of access. And again, those packages of, for example, most of these sort of social protection uh, packages have some nutrition or food element in them and, and helping those elements to be designed the right way to meet the needs of those populations would be important. You know, there are examples in history where 
you know, the social protection packages didn't actually meet the nutritional needs of the populations and even ended up causing things like obesity or, you know, not, not being of good nutrient quality. So that's, again, right on an area where a good connection and conversation with the technical side of things on what works, the types of foods that need to go into packages, potentially fortifying them with the right nutrients would be important. And we would really love to continue this conversation and to be part of helping, you know, the design and delivery of this and these programs in helping the world to be more resilient for the populations that need these interventions most. Great. Thank you, Mandata. Very good. That's a very good, thoughtful way to end that off, uh, particularly in the fact that, you know, there is an intention to promote sustainability and also resiliency at the same time. As I mentioned before, uh, climate change is coming and as it is advancing in certain parts of the world. And there's a need to be more resilient in uh, different communities, particularly in the agricultural se sector to support sustainable livelihoods, but also the health and well-being of those persons who live in those uh, communities as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very broad subject, but certainly one where the Canadian agricultural sector can benefit from a partnership with different countries in Africa that are trying to promote the health and well-being of girls and young women and also participation in the sector. It's, uh, it's not just you know the production and what you eat, but also the roles and uh, other sorts of value added or uh, supply chain elements that the women and girls can participate in at the same time. So that being said, uh, today's presentation was on nutrition security, gender equality, and sustainable development. I would like to thank our three presenters, Dr. Pat Itomi, Chief Executive Officer of the Integrated Produce City in Lagos, Nigeria. Dr. Teddy Sami, Director of Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton. And Dr. Mandela Rabi, the Vice President of Global Technical Services and Technical Advisor of Nutrition International here in Ottawa, Canada. Great insight, great discussion. I can see great opportunities for cooperation and uh, interaction moving forward. <laughs>